Welcome to Wrecked, the Michael Rectenwald podcast, and this is episode one. And today I'm joined by a special guest, John Kleisick. John Kleisick has an MA in English and has taught college rhetoric and research documentation argumentation for over a decade. His scholarship concentrates on the history of global uh, eugenics and Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel, Brave New World. He is the author of a great book called School World Order, The Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. And he is a contributor uh, to Unlimited Hangout, a great uh, publication, uh, The Activist Post, The Center for Research on Globalization, and many other publications. And this should make you a little wary. John is also a black belt in classical Taekwondo, so don't mess with him. And uh, he also a certified kickboxing instructor, instructor under the International Muay Thai Boxing Association. So if things get rough, uh, John will be kicking his way out of this. Let's get started. Hello, John. How are you? How, I'm doing all right. How you doing, Michael? Thanks for having me. Great, to, great to have you. So your work in uh, in education, in particular, uh, the School World Order book, uh, deals with public education. And so what I thought we'd do is take a look under the hood of public education. Uh, in other words, uh, as anti-status, we definitely do not prefer public education. It's a means of indoctrinating students and creating little good good little statists. But you have a lot of documentation, and uh, you've done a great deal of historical study and some futuristic projections into uh, the uh, public education system. So why don't you tell us a little bit first about like public education and its history? So public education, at least in the United States, uh, starts somewhere around mid-19th century Um and basically, it has two main functions. Uh, one is basically to develop a citizenry, um, and so it has a political angle. Another is to develop a workforce, so it has an economic angle. Uh, John Taylor Gatto in uh, the uh, Underground History of America basically refers to this this first uh, this beginnings of public education uh, under Horace Mann was basically uh, one of the premiers that sort of brought it about as the beginning of compulsory education um, and then from there we sort of have a couple different phases throughout the history of American education and that basically goes from compulsory education to a process of federalization and then to a process of corporatization in which the state and the corporate sector merge and then my book takes off uh, where technology sort of um, uh, drives that to its logical conclusion in, into something that Kurzweil would call Ray Kurzweil would call the singularity. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of uh, pedagogy that has uh, that has been informing public education from the outset. You know some of the pedagogical uh, philosophy behind it. I think Dewey and Mann and others, especially uh, important there. Let's talk about that ideology and uh, the pedagogy and uh, just what kind of people is this system has, what kind of people has this system been trying to produce? So um, a lot of my research also focuses on how the Order of Skull and Bones, which is a Yale secret society, a fraternity, um, how they have been instrumental in setting up not just a compulsory education system, uh, but also a pedagogy that's rooted in Hegelian collectivism, and then also a methodology that utilizes stimulus response psychology in order to condition students to have the appropriate um, the politically correct thought processes and also the appropriate uh, workforce skills. So it's basically a mix of Hegelian collectivism with a uh, Wintian stimulus response psychology would be the pedagogy and the methodology. And again, the goal here is to basically use use the psychological conditioning in order to inculcate the various citizenry into a larger political economic collective that builds essentially a controlled workforce that serves the state. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Um, so now uh, some of the uh, technologies of late that have been 
uh, that are being introduced. Uh, well, you you've done uh, work on uh, some some technologies in terms of uh, you know not just the behaviorist uh, methodologies, but also the kind of techne that has been appropriated by education. Uh, what's it called? Uh, educational technology or something like that. Yeah, it's the broader, you know, they use a little um, euphemism. Ed tech is sort of the truncated uh, buzzword for all things educational technology. And in my book, I sort of break it down into um, three broader classes and then sort of a, a fourth class that sort of integrates the other three. So the, the first three classes are the adaptive learning course where the socio-emotional learning biofeedback wearables. And then there's this other burgeoning trend called precision education, which basically is going to use various uh, genetic screening technologies in order to um, cap a student's um, their their learning based on their their genetic IQ effectively. Okay, and the data that'll be extracted from these three three categories of ed tech, especially the first two, the the adaptive learning courseware and the socio emotional biofeedback wearables. Those are gonna be data mined to enhance artificial intelligence in the in the limited sense of ed tech, but also in the broader sense of the goal of developing an artificial general intelligence. And then eventually something like Elon Musk's Neuralink would interface uh, the populace with, with that broader artificial intelligence through the internet of things in the internet of bodies. Right, so let's, let's just define a few of these things. Um... Uh, well, let's let's backtrack a little bit uh, before we go further on on this track, uh, and talk a little bit about the role of uh, you know eugenics and uh, you know neo Darwinism and you know social Darwinism in in the uh, education system coming out of uh, you know the Germans that you you've talked about and uh, uh, Dewey and so on. If you could talk a little bit about, like, uh, what role has eugenics played, uh, you know, connected to the IQ test, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so in, um, in my book, I cite uh, uh, John Taylor Gatto's uh, work quite frequently. Um, and in particular, one of the citations that I reference, and there's an essay in there called Against Schooling. And in this, uh, he breaks down um, the five principles of education that were... Um, published by Alexander Inglis, um, who was uh, the head of the faculty, education faculty at Harvard at the time. And one of the principles is the selective function. And so he's basically uh, using that term, playing on Darwin's idea of natural selection. So one of the principles of education is to sort of weed out uh, the so-called unfit from the uh, reproductive sweepstakes. And one of the ways that you would do that would be um, essentially to, to create sort of a social hierarchy within, within the class structure. Uh, and one of the, one of the metrics for who should be, you know, um, considered unfit was, had to do a lot with IQ. And so, and so based on these theories though, there, there became something called in the early 20th century here, um, precision education and it's a play on something called precision medicine and precision medicine is basically a push uh i think it was obama that came up with the precision medicine initiative but it was a it was an angle to um, convert all forms of medicine all health care to be uh personalized based on genetics so just rem just take that out of the healthcare industry move it to the uh, education industry, and basically you're gonna personalize the student's education based on their uh, genetic IQ metrics, which is essentially comes directly out of the, the whole eugenic uh, leveraging of the Simons-Binet IQ tests. Um, some of the early tests that, that substantiated the Simons-Binet in terms of uh, eugenic uh, classification uh, had to do with, in Indiana, there was the uh, cases of the the Jukes and the Calicax, uh, and there was, I think it was the Vineland School for the Feeble-Minded, and the guy's name, I believe, was H.H. H. Goddard, was the guy that, run, that ran it. So it, so today, precision education basically comes out of this whole idea of mental hygiene, eugenics. So what, what do you think the overall function of all this is? Is it just to stratify the, pop, the workforce, to uh, stratify uh, the labor 
outputs that are expected here, or is there something else going on? Yeah, effectively, I, I believe that's the case. Um, you know, essentially to create a, a cast system. So we're, we've touched on sort of the, some of the biometric basis for this uh, for this cast system, but uh, w when we dig into the uh, psychometrics and, and look at some of how the uh, the other ed tech devices like the adaptive learning courseware and the biofeedback wearables fit into the equation. Uh, the CAS system is is as much psychometric as it is biometric, but it's basically just like as you know, stratify a workforce in terms of the necessary hierarchy uh, of basically worker bees feeding into sort of the the bored hive mind run by this sort of uh, corporate government AI technocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that a bit. Uh... You're, you're suggesting, and you said this before with reference to the Hegelian uh, element, that there's a collectivism under this. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? What, what is collectivist about it, and uh, how does that, how does that uh, impact uh, the uh, pedagogical methodologies? Well, so one way that we can see the uh, sort of the manifestation of the, the collectivist Hegelianism through education would be uh, through some of the SDGs at this point, um, and I believe it's SDG number four that uh, focuses on education, and one of the sub points. So you know you have four point one through however many uh, under that under that particular. Well, let me just point out that these SDGs come out of the Agenda 2030. These are sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030 uh, project. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and, and most people, when they hear that, right, they think like, well, so all things environmentalism, right? So in other words, you know, green technology, stewarding the environmental resources, maybe regulating certain industries. But what a lot of people may not be aware of is that they also have a broader economic program for reducing poverty through what they call uh, stakeholder partnerships. They literally use the stakeholder capitalism language. But then there's also provisions for education, and in there, like again, I believe it's I believe it's uh, SDG number four, uh, and one of the sub goals is to create a global citizenry. Right. In other words, everything that somebody learns in a given school in a given nation state should ultimately condition them to uh, be good global citizens in the larger uh, stakeholder capitalist world economy. So that's 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 yeah. one way that we can see. Uh, how this sort of collectivism, uh, how, it, how it pans out through the education system. Yeah, excellent. So, yeah, let's just, uh, let me just say a few things here about stakeholder capitalism, where this comes from. Uh, in case you're not familiar, uh, stakeholder capitalism is the brainchild of the World Economic Forum, in particular, Klaus Schwab. Uh, I think he founded that idea in, in really in 1971 in his book, uh, 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 Corporate Enterprise Management and Mechanical Engineering, of all things. And in this book, he buries this little nugget of stakeholder capitalism, which is this new, supposedly new form of capitalism in, in under which uh, corporations no longer simply serve uh, for, uh, to make profit for, for their shareholders, but are supposed to serve all of their stakeholders, inclusive of, um, you know, the community, uh, uh, you know, the uh, workers, the customers, but also the planet. And uh, so really this stakeholder regime, and, and it's being driven largely through the uh, environmental, social, and governance index on the stock market and uh, in banking, uh, the, this stakeholder regime is a, I have argued is a form of, it's a demarcation device in order to basically starve out, uh, particular players from the economy by directing all capital investments towards compliant corporations and companies. What do you, would you add anything to that, uh, Jake? Yeah, well, one thing that's uh, worth pointing out is that in about 1973, so during the third annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, this was the meeting at which uh, Klaus Schwab pitched his stakeholder capitalism project to the WEF, but this was also the same meeting at which uh, Aurelio Pecci, who was a co-founder of the Club of Rome, uh, pitched the, uh, the premise or the thesis 
of the limits to growth doctrine, which is basically the this neo Malthusian environmentalist uh, project that, that becomes the impetus for the uh, the SDGs. Uh, both of those were pitched at the same annual meeting, uh, and it's worth noting here that also in attendance there, as I believe it was the honorary sponsor, was uh, the founder of the Bilderberg Group, who was uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, and he was a former Nazi SS. So uh, the, the, the convening of these three people together sort of demonstrates that the stakeholder capitalism and the sustainable development go together hand in hand with this uh, corporate roundtable mode of global governance. Yeah, so yeah, let's let's get into a little bit of that about some of these globalist organizations you've mentioned and uh, which I've treated in my book and, and you uh, did a lot of the research for me on the Great Reset and the struggle for liberty. These globalist organizations, uh, beginning with uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs, or Chatham House, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the, the uh, Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, the World Economic Forum, and the Trilateral Commission. What, what can we say about these organizations and uh, what their impact, what kind of impact they're having on, on governance globally and on the economy in particular? Since we're taking, we'll take a little segue into this discussion on globalism and what these organizations' agendas are and how they are influencing uh, global governance and uh, likewise national government, etc. Yeah, so the, um, so the, the, the precursor to all those would have been uh, what Lord Mil Milner called his roundtable groups, and he actually had a publication called The Roundtable, and these were sort of uh, stemmed out of Cecil Rhodes's Rhodes Trust uh, and his Rhodes Society. So Cecil Rhodes set up the Rhodes Society basically as a program to uh, indoctrinate uh, colonial uh, intellects into becoming Anglophiles so that they would basically come back and propagate and promote and, and enforce uh, British imperialism in their, in their home colonial states. Um, and the roundtable organizations were basically these, these um, groups, uh, think tanks, NGOs, you would call them nowadays, where uh, in those given nation states, those colonial powers, there, there would be a, a meeting of all, all sectors of the, of the economy and the state. So, you, you know, heads of state, uh, business people, you know, heads of media, uh, perhaps religious figures, um, and these people would sort of come together and, and brainstorm ways to... Um, plan the global economy in line with sort of British imperialism. Um, well, after the world wars, uh, or to begin with, after World War I, um, you had sort of this shift, what, what Carol Quigley calls to the, to the Anglo-American establishment. And, and so um, in many ways, this is where, this is why the RIIA or Chatham House Royal Institute of International Affairs uh, had basically a counterpart uh, developed at the same time, and that was the Council on Foreign Relations. So this was basically the American counterpart to the British Chatham House, um, and this also uh, marks the point at which the you know the the American uh, power be basically becomes the the superpower or the rise of the American superpower. And so, in many ways, what you see is uh, sort of the the British imperial project sort of morph or merge into. Uh, the American project and it, and through these satellite roundtables, um, they started to basically, I guess today we call it diversify or branch out. And so after World War II, you had the Bilderberg Group set up and that was largely, the focus of that was mainly to sort of uh, galvanize or collectivize all of Europe into what is now the EU. Um, and then later on, the Club of Rome is set up in the late 60s, and this Club of Rome is largely focused on uh, all things environmental, so a global environmental project. So that brings in sort of the environmental angle to the, to the um, political economic planning that was part of the previous roundtables. Uh, then the, the World Economic Forum is a few, a few years later is set up. It was actually at the time called the European Management Forum. So it was sort of... Uh, 
set up more in line with the Bilderberg group, but then quickly branched out to sort of include more uh, of the non-Western nation states into the, the, uh, the planning process. And that the Trilateral Commission basically sort of does the same thing with a, with a heavy emphasis on uh, relations between Western powers and Asian, East Asian powers. Uh, and so when you get to, to the modern era here, what we have is something like the World Economic Forum, where as uh, you and I put together in that chart in your book, The um, uh, Great Reset and the Struggle for Liberty, um, we have representatives from from all over the place, right? Um, and not right. just not just representing either the British Empire or the Anglo American establishment, but truly, like a a, a global diversified um, uh, powerhouse, multicultural, and, multilateral uh, kind of uh, kind of. Uh, they're trying to represent uh, the idea that all these people, uh, these exotic peoples, you know, from their standpoint. Uh, are representing the whole globe in some sense, and likewise their project, which is an englobalist uh, agenda, doesn't look like it's being superimposed by some centralized European elite. It, it gives the appearance of buy-in from these uh, from these peoples. I think it's a very thin scrim to hide their uh, uh, overall globalist uh, world uh, single world government objectives. Yeah, and, and as we also uh, found, uh, sort of digging into the mission statements, the updated mission statements of even you know the, the British Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations is is this emphasis on DEI, this uh, this emphasis on diversification and equity and including uh, all these other uh, nation states or representatives of these non-Western nation states, even into the earlier roundtables that were set up, right, from a, from uh, an Anglo-American perspective. And uh, as you demonstrated uh, in your presentation at the recent, most recent uh, American Freedom Alliance conference, um, what you have on uh, the board, the boards of all of these roundtables that we noted, was at least one high-level Chinese national uh, who, who had their hands often in uh, investments in other American corporations or were perhaps uh, members of the the Chinese Communist Party itself so so uh, you know what what I see uh, in this next phase here is sort of how I described the the shift from the British Imperial project to this anglo-American project which in many ways mm -hmm. at least looks different or right has has a different uh, spectrum of, of representatives in terms of its you know uh, member states uh, is a similar shift going to be from basically this Anglo-American establishment to what they're going what the World Economic Forum is calling the multipolar world order, which I, which in my opinion is basically just a euphemism for a for a one world order uh, of which China is the model and which mm -hmm. will essentially be the new core of that new uh, global governance system. Yes, I've, I agree. China is definitely the model. Um, they've said that clearly. Um, Marie Strong said it. Uh, recently, Schwab said it on Chinese, official Chinese TV. He said, he said that, uh, you know, China's a good model for many countries. Uh, so <laughs> that was a sort of mix between Schwab's uh, German and uh, Chinese uh, accent there. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that the idea there is that, uh, you know, uh, China is, uh, what do they like about China? They like the idea that they have uh, sort of a oligarchical uh, corporate uh, power on the top with, uh, you know, profit production for a few uh, and a kind of uh, a static, social, a static economic order uh, and uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a kind of technological control and surveillance over the population. This seems to be the model. Uh, don't you think? Yeah, I, I like the sort of the the dialectic that you showed uh, between sort of uh, demonstrating the shift from like Maoist style communism to uh, what Xi Jinping calls uh, Chinese. Uh, I think it's socialism. Socialism with Chinese, with Chinese characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And basically, what you show is that what 
that's basically a process by which the, the Maoist form of communism integrates modes of market capitalism or what we might call fascism and sort of puts these two together into this technocratic blend while mm -hmm. on the other end of the spectrum, right, we sort of are doing just the inverse, right? So we have this, yeah. we have this market economy and we're slowly bringing in these collectivist sort of uh, socialist, communist, right. otherwise statist methods of control of the economy uh one of the impetus that that we're seeing now is effectively the, the esg scoring right yeah the esg is just a it's a um it's a demarcation device for 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 admitting uh corporations companies into this approved uh regime of these pr approved producers and it's not status directly i mean it's extra governmental in a sense because it's using uh, corporate coercion in order to uh, force this regime on these corporate players. And then, of course, it's followed up by executive fiat and government and legislation. But I think it's pre-legislative, uh, le wouldn't you think? Well, yeah, I mean, this this might actually sort of bring us back to the, to the school topic, too, is Good. because, you know, part of what is going to enforce that system, and we've, we've sort of seen companies... Um, you know, as of late with the whole Bud Light thing, right? Want to, uh, you know, virtue signal their inclus inclusivity, not just uh, because they think it's good PR. Uh, clearly, it wasn't for for uh, Bud Light, but that, but more so right. that it's it's good for their ESG score, which um, right. you know. So you're kind of seeing this tug of war between you know the actual consumers and the sort of the pr disaster on that end of this of the sort of the, the yeah. dialect but then you at the same time uh you know they still have this incentive to meet the esg scores and so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out but you know another element mm -hmm. again going back to the schools is that the people who um you know are put in in the CEO or other executive positions to basically make the the decision. Like, do we want to go with uh, pleasing the the uh, the consumer, or do we want to want to make sure our ESG score is high? I mean, those a lot of those people are they're coming up through an education system where they've been effectively indoctrinated with woke identitarian politics for you know their entire life for the most part. Uh, and right. so that that is its own uh, sort of, as you meant, like pre-legislative enforcement mechanism because it's sort of enculturated in their in their their outlook, and they they bring that to the table before they even have any pressure placed upon them from the consumer or the ESG scoring. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of like there's a battle between finance capital on the one hand and uh, consumer cap, cap capital on the other. I mean, the finance capital is what's driving this ESG. People like Larry Fink dictating terms, telling companies, if you don't make this ESG bar, uh, if you don't you know, cut the ESG score, basically you're, you're out because we're going to see, as he called it, a tectonic shift of capital toward these uh, ESG compliant companies and away from these others. So this is a, this is not the state per se, but it is the establishment, uh, and uh, they have then, of course, state repercussions or follow up with this. I think that it's the best way to put it. It's kind of like the state comes along afterwards, and effectively uh, legislates this after the fact, after these corporations have been coerced into this regime. And I think you're right. The these corporations, all these uh, major players, they've been indoctrinated through education and uh, uh, they've been uh, brought into this regime over many years and uh, through public education or even private education in the university systems, uh, which is completely, uh, completely sold into uh, this kind of uh, thinking. Uh, so this kind of uh, perpetrates itself. Uh, you don't even need to legislate it, really. Yeah, I, I, I've been recently in contact with um, some of the uh, Undercover Mothers, uh, which is an organization that um, has been exposing a lot of the um, ills of the school system, uh, a lot of the woke stuff. Um, and in, in particular, uh, what, what I find 
uh, particularly important about some of the work that they've done that I that I wasn't even uh, fully aware of uh, has to do with how the the private school system and not just the private school system but like the elite private school system like the Groton school oh, yeah. like Hotchkiss like right those types of like schools where uh, you know the elite are basically you know bread uh you know charlotte's dad went to hotchkiss uh and so did um you'll remember yeah, charlotte thing, right? Iserby, right Char yeah, charlotte sorry, Iserby. Charlotte, yeah charlotte thompson Iserby wrote the forward to my book uh, wrote the deliberate dumbing down of america um 700 page book on the federalization of education and globalization pretty much the 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 foundation of most of the research that goes into my book um but but you know her dad who was skull and bones right he went to hotchkiss well um you know, apparently through the accreditation systems for the private schools, uh, the National Association for Independent Schools would be one of the accrediting uh, agencies. Right. That they they promote and they push right uh, DEI and you know all all the woke critical theory stuff uh, that we see at the public school level. So a lot of people think, well, I'll just go to a private school, uh, but. Through the accreditation system, basically you have the same system, and so it's not just that you know the worker bees are sort of being indoctrinated with this this sort of uh, ESG uh, mindset, but uh, early as, as early as as the uh, you know the youth of the elite, they're also being indoctrinated, and so you know these these are most likely going to be the people that are the CEOs or the trustees or the presidents. And so they're bringing it there from the top down and the bottom up together. Yeah, yeah. and it would seem the, the, these elite institutions and the indoctrination of these, uh, you know, elite subjects would be even more important than getting the uh, the working classes involved because, after all, they're not going to make any decisions, even though we're called, you know, the workers are called stakeholders in this regime. They have really no say whatsoever about any of this. And uh, nobody vote, you know, they haven't voted on the Paris uh, Climate Accord, and they haven't decided that this is the way things should go economically, and they're going to pay for it tremendously, uh, at, you know, in energy costs and all kinds of transitions away from uh, so-called fossil fuel use and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, taxes uh, they're going to be paying for these uh you know, transitions to uh, renewable energy. Uh, they're going to pay for that renewable energy, and they're going to pay taxes for the for the um, uh, the uh, subsidies for those renewables. So this is enormous. Uh, anyway. Well, yeah. One of the things she also noted was that because uh, she's got some kids, uh, this is uh, one of, one of the undercover mothers uh, that are in in uh, I think the. the I forget which which school it's not important but they were studying economics and she was saying that you know the math that they're doing she's like this is not the type this is not up to par with the type of math you need to run you can to, to to be any sort of economist worth their salt uh and the thing was that uh you know we sort of discussed it and you know why why do you need to have the the mathematics for the economics if you're essentially in this ESG system, as you know, where effectively you don't have to worry so much about are the consumers going to buy it, right? Are the markets going to be ready for it? You're, you're not looking at that and you're just looking at, am I going to be attracting enough finance from the top down? And then whether or not anybody buys it, it doesn't matter because my ESG score makes my, my stock go up and it keeps me basically uh, afloat. So you don't really need to have traditional market economics to run a company <laughs> under ESG scoring because everything is guaranteed a priori. Exactly. Except, of course, you know, this will flop. And I mean, this is un unsustainable uh, uh, economically. It can't work for long. Uh, so it will implode, but it will exact tremendous pain in the process. And it could drag on for decades before it finally completely collapses. Yeah, and I think that's, I think the reason why they're so willing to um, sort of ram this through at this point in history is because if they were to do that under, in a society that doesn't have the control grid, the social credit system that they plan to have fully installed very soon, uh, you know, there would be lots of unrest and uh, lots of repercussions 
uh, that right might not go so well for the people who hold the the yeah. power, whether corporate or government. But right, if you basically do a controlled demolition of the economy and guarantee that you your company sits perched on top of the hierarchy through this ESG system, uh, and you have the social credit surveillance grid in place, well, what do you, I think they assume that what is the average person going to be able to do about it? So as as it right. implodes, they're still going to be forced to have to comply with their own ESG social credit score. They're not going to have any alternative markets to go to. And if they try to go outside of either of those paradigms, there'll be all sorts of automated repercussions, uh, uh, you know, and per perhaps even maybe label you a, a terrorist or, or so something else to sort of pre-crime you or, or disappear right. you. This is where the fourth industrial revolution comes in, of course, is uh, once they establish this sort of, uh, you know, goes back to this kind of a caste system uh, through uh, this ESG and through the stakeholder regime, which is ironically built as something that benefits all stakeholders, but uh, is anything but the sort. It's everything they say is really the inverse of the truth. We, we know that. Uh, so, uh, isn't it uh, something that now the technology comes in? This is where all of the uh, surveillance technology, all the fourth industrial revolution technologies, which some of which you've already referred to, like the Internet of Bodies, the uh, the metaverse, even and the um, the transhumanist technologies like brain cloud interfaces, and all of these things are, uh, I think, the way I look at it is these are. Uh, these are the technologies that are meant to, you know, contain the social body after this kind of reset has been enacted. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, the, the goal here is it's, it's basically a giant Skinner box, right? So uh, what I did mention before <laughs> is that adaptive learning courseware literally comes out of B.F. Skinner's teaching machine. So he used to have these, um, you know, he, he took the idea of stimulus response psychology. So all learning or all behavior can be reduced to a person's f physiological responses to environmental stimuli. So basically he just took that concept and uh, converted the environmental stimuli to learning stimuli. So whether it be question answer, multiple choice, short answer, matching, something like that. And he had an analog system. You put it on a gears on a wheel of a tape, sort of like a like an old style Viewmaster. It's got two slots. The learning stimuli is on one slot. You scribe your answer on the other. Turn the, the gear. You get automated, personalized re response. Some of them would dispense chocolate to reinforce the behavior. So you just take that and digitize it. Convert the gears and wheels to windows on a computer. You can click the 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 knob to a click on a mouse and maybe you gamify mm -hmm. it a little bit so you have some yeah. of those dopamine triggers with the reward system being through uh any of the, the digital badges you can earn by winning the learning game maybe put some videos in it okay um but basically then take that concept and, and take it out of the school and just sort of put it into the broader market and incentivize particular behaviors with whether they be monetary rewards or punishments, but they could also just restrict your access to the market, right? They could restrict your access to right. travel, as we saw with sort of the um, with the the COVID jabs, right? Uh, you know, if you didn't have your jab, yeah, you know, I still haven't been uh, in a classroom since then. I have to be online in order to work there um, because, right? That was one of the incentive incentives uh, to get you to comply to whatever are the the corporate government uh, mandate. So basically, what mm -hmm. you know, the, the entire social credit system is basically just sort of uh, creating uh, a ubiquitous what what he called the Skinner box. So that was he, he referred to his teaching machines as his box. So literally, he referred to the teaching machines as a Skinner box. But the original uh, reference was to sort of the the he, he built on E.L. Thorndike's puzzle box experiments, where E.L. Thorndike at uh, Columbia College used to put you know the pigeons and rats and the mages in the mazes and see if you could condition them to uh, perform certain behaviors. Uh, Skinner Skinner converted it uh, and made it operant, which meant instead of just could they perform a particular behavior, it was could they could they perform an operation? So they often had like mm. pigeons that would like push buttons 
to operate a, a very simplistic mechanism. And there was actually something called Project Pigeon with the United States military where they, were, where they worked with him to see if they could get pigeons to uh, launch missiles. <laughs> I thought I'm going to peck the, the buttons. <laughs> like, anyway, so that's, so that's the broader... Um, that's that's basically the system that we're seeing here is a, is a broader social is a Skinner box method of social credit basically. So this, you're saying that the social the social credit score, which of course is, you know, putatively implemented in China and appears to be on the horizon in the West, and is already sort of being introduced vis-a-vis. Um, uh, well, it will be very strongly introduced if we get to a centralized uh, central bank digital currency, won't it? And uh, uh, social and a digital identity, which is another one of these technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we would have this uh, sort of the score system, uh, which would then uh, effectively uh, monitor all of our behaviors and give us a sort of an out, uh, output, a reward system or penalty, pun punishment system. Uh, that's like a, a giant Skinner box, effectively, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, again, if you're reducing all behaviors to responses to punishments and rewards, then all you have to do is make it so that every time, every every mode of societal interaction, whether commercial, public, private, healthcare, transportation, workforce, education, uh, right, uh, just, just assembling together for a rally, if, if you can set up a technology grid that can... Right, whether through biometrics or through a digital ID, track and trace everywhere you go and everything you do, then it can basically force you to behave the way it wants you to behave in all those different scenarios by either blocking your access to them when you don't comply or incentivizing maybe if you get a really high social credit score, maybe you get a discount on some purchases, which they actually do in China as well. So it's it's yeah. basically just his his whole theory of learning and behavior writ large. He actually has another book it's called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, right? Because for him, right, the, the very notion of freedom and dignity are like these like antiquarian sort of notions, almost, you know, uh, anachronistic, like like superstitions, right? That like, because yeah. freedom implies volition, implies conscience, it implies more than just these physiological reflexes. And dignity, right, would also... Uh, be predicated on again some sort of agency or volition but for him there, there is none the the inner monologue that you have in your head the thing that you call the self right the that thing uh that's just an illusion it's not it's it's yeah. it's ephemeral like for someone like Yuval Noah Harari he literally right. when he, in um uh homo deus he's he you know speculates on the nature of consciousness and at one point he says well, it might be nothing more than the roar of an engine as it as a plane goes through the sky which the roar of an engine is totally a byproduct right the roar of the engine yeah. does not propel the plane it has no function in in making the plane uh get off the ground or land it's just the sound that comes after all that has happened so he, right. he speculates a phenomenon yeah yeah exactly yeah uh, yeah. So yeah, I was wondering if you tied into Harari because he's the now. He's of course the uh, sage, uh, WEF sanctioned sage uh, of uh, you know this fourth industrial revolution technology, and uh, says that human beings are completely hackable. The idea of free will is history, and further that Jesus is fake news. So um, he's a very pleasant fellow, and. Uh, so let's take this now into the question of, uh, you know, this education that we've talked about is obviously the idea here has been to produce a certain type of subject that will be completely amenable to the system that's being implemented. In this case, now we're looking at, of course, this stakeholder ESG, personal uh, personal uh, carbon allowance uh uh, social credit score system, uh, all that. So, uh, just what would, you know, and then there's the question of, uh, will is, uh, you know, they're talking about the idea that they can hack us so that, uh, effectively we would become remote control subjects. So this is really what they say. This isn't just us talking. They say this. So, um, uh, that would lead our, 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 our listeners, I hope 
uh, to think about what well, well, what are what are our re- what's our recourse here? Yeah, so you know, I, I could, when I wrote the book, uh, this was before COVID, and I thought I would have at least like ten years to sort of you know sound the alarm. I figured I'd sound really kooky at first, but you know, slowly as these things started to emerge into public discourse, you know, or in the commercial scene that people would be like, oh, this is what that guy was talking about, and at least have a heads up on some of the, uh, you know, not so pleasant implications. Uh, Then COVID happened. uh, And, you know, I was hoping, you know, prior to that, that, you know, I'm a public educator, I was hoping that, you know, I I could try to work within the system and maybe, you know, uh, wake some people up and, and, you know, maybe uh, garner some sort of uh, resistance, right? Some sort of, um, you know, uh, counter uh, pedagogy or methodology or some reform from the inside. And uh, COVID just uh, accelerated everything, right? I mean, like the stuff that I thought mm-hmm. I had years to talk about, I mean, because we were forced to use distance learning and everything was online. And so that meant, uh, and then the CARES money came out and that gave every school millions of dollars to purchase Right, not just the learning management system, which are the dashboards where you put all these different applications, uh, but then to also, you know, like for dental tech at one of the schools, well, you can't go and work on a person during COVID. Well, you need a simulator, right? And so they had, it was a silly little 2D simulator. It was like literally a cartoon guy. And he'd, you know, have, he'd have some sort of symptoms that would somehow have a graphic and then you'd have to diagnose. Uh, but, you know, just move, move forward into the future and we'll have metaverse stuff and you know this is sort of just getting the ball rolling so at this point uh you know i have to say that the, you know your, your main recourse is to get out of the public school system as much as possible um and that doesn't mean that you know when you're out of it uh, doing some homeschooling uh building either what they call sometimes the co-ops or the pods right getting together with other like-minded families in your neighborhood helping each other mm-hmm. facilitate the homeschooling maybe find uh some other uh disaffected or open-minded educators like myself who would be willing to maybe help out in uh whatever areas you might feel like uh you're you you need some some professional assistance um, and beyond that, um, you know, you could still go. You, you, it doesn't preclude that you can't go to the school board meetings to, uh, you know, still voice your opinion uh, and potentially vote vote out or run for school board. Uh, because even if you take your kids out of the public schools and thereby take away their attendance money, which is a big bulk of the, the financing that they have, um, you're still paying for the schools with your taxes. So you have every right uh, to go and, you know, uh, voice your opinion about what's going on with the public schools. And, and maybe by voting with your dollars, getting out of that s- system, starving them of the attendance money, and then going and having a polite dialogue. You have to be extremely careful about how you engage in these scenarios, uh, because as we've seen, uh, the Department of Justice has already uh, attempted to label uh upset parents as uh domestic terrorists i believe moms for liberty was just uh, listed as mm-hmm. a group um yeah so yeah, by that, the, uh, yeah yeah by the uh, southern poverty uh, southern uh poverty law center yeah. yeah yeah so so you have to be your rhetoric uh your your logos is, is is obviously extremely important that means come with facts come with literature whatever you're saying print out some primary sources maybe if it's something to do with the new federal legislation or the state legislation so you can hand out and they can see that you're not just talking you know make, making up conspiracy theories right but in doing so what i have the conclusion i've come to uh in this modern era um and much of this has to do with the sort of the uh, uh abdication of the classical method where, where we don't teach logic and grammar uh and rhetoric anymore and, and that is that most people are persuaded more by pathos and ethos than they are by logos. Now, the, the logos is, is what should actually ultimately convince you uh, of something, right? It's the, it's the actual mm-hmm. truth of the matter. Uh, but if you come into this scenario with a uh, perfect logos, but you come in, right, and you and your energy is a little too upset or hyped up, uh, even, you know, your tone might, might be off, uh, they'll immediately point the finger at you and try to call you a terrorist so yeah. you have to come in there uh as as polite as possible so yeah so 
Yeah, for those who may not be familiar with the triumvirate of this Aristotelian rhetoric, uh, which John has briefly uh, glossed, and that is there's three elements, of course. There's the logos or the reasoning, reasoning, and then, and then of course, the pathos, which is the emotive force, and then ethos, which is the credibility of the speaker. Anyway, um, sorry, I couldn't resist. I've been out of the classroom so long. I, I just wanted to uh, take a uh, Take a pedestal there for a second. Oh, yeah, no, that's uh, anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> take take a uh, a pulpit for a second, I should say. Okay, so those are things we. Uh, I'm sorry, people... I should um, I should I don't know why I didn't say this, but you could also go to something uh, you know if you're wanting to just learn for the sake of learning and not for some sort of accreditation. Uh, you uh, you should go. You could go to something like Richard Grove's uh, Autonomy University. I. I believe I sh will be uh, developing some lectures on some some lessons, some lectures on rhetoric, and I think you might be uh, doing some lectures and, uh, or some lessons as well. So then that's another yeah, that's uh, right. another option. I should have mentioned that. Sorry. Yeah, things like that. And of course, uh, in our circles, there's uh, Tom Wood's uh, Liberty Classroom, uh, the Ron Paul uh, curriculum for uh, K through 12 uh and others so yeah that's that now what about the adult world uh where we're fighting out uh, the um you know the esg we're fighting the um you know, we've been told now there's going to be a new disease x coming uh down the cdc has told us about disease x that's next and uh uh the uh you know the social credit score the whole nine yards with the um and the the whole uh, ESG regime, the, the, the climate change uh, rhetoric and uh, argumentation and, uh, and policy, which is going to be coming down on us very hard uh, if things don't change. Uh, what about how do we oppose these things? I, I've given a nine-point plan in my book, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so that's that's, I mean, each of those angles – might take a slightly different uh, strategy. I always say that the first and most important is, you know, regardless of whatever five, nine, ten point platform program I could offer, uh, none of that is going to make a whole lot of difference if we don't in our daily lives uh, make an effort to minimize our usage of these various technologies as much mm -hmm. as possible. And then to the extent that we use them, right, we need to try to use uh, platforms, applications, devices uh, that uh, engage in as little data mining or data tracking as possible using encrypted applications uh, as much mm -hmm. as possible. And I'm, and, you know, I'm guilty of it. You know, I still have a Gmail because, you know, everything is so busy that I'm off to have to reset all my contacts. And it's so you do it one step at a time, right? You slowly, right? Um, you know, this, this month work on changing your email. Next month work on uh, I was told by a friend, uh, I believe you've been on your show, Herbovier Morick, that um, there's yeah. there are uh, Android uh, devices, or there that you can you can reset the operating system. So ba because otherwise, Google basically is just in there tracking stuff all the time, and there's ways right. to uh, reconfigure the phone itself, the hardware, or the or at least the yeah. operating system. So you know, just not all at once, but you know, one one thing at a time. Uh, and then mm -hmm. otherwise, uh, you know, just, you know, non-compliance as much as possible as we saw with the, um, the, the whole, you know, the jab scenario. I mean, uh, I'm not looking for, I, I've heard that recently uh, Biden uh, required uh, masks and testing at a, at a recent event. Uh, I saw a headline on uh, Patrick Wood's Technocracy News. Um, didn't, didn't read a whole lot about it. Uh, just sort of skimmed it. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, disease X might be coming around the corner, but, uh, you know, we at least, I, I like to think that, you know, it was a, it was a lot more resistance than they planned for. Uh, and then in doing so you have to stay again, you have to stay as peaceful as possible because the, the main goal or the, the main Trump card they're going to try to use is to label anybody that that goes outside of this paradigm that resists in any way. So label you're not just a conspiracy theorist or somebody who's mentally ill, but quite literally a, a terrorist in the wake of the whole January 6th 
uh, PSYOP. So, uh, so those are, those are the three sort of basic things I could say, you know, abstain from these technologies and devices as much as possible. Don't comply, use cash whenever you can. Uh, and then in the process, when you go to, a, if you're going to go to an event, a rally, a town hall, remember the first and foremost, most important thing is, right, do not give them any, any, any angle at which they could suggest or imply that you're anything other than uh, a peaceful human being that's trying to uh, live peacefully and freely uh, without, uh, you know, uh, aggressing on anybody else. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so yeah, you you hit you hit several of the of the points in the nine point plan. I don't know if you've ever uh, read it, but uh, if you've gotten a chance to look at that, but uh, yeah, the the resist these technologies. The um, first of all, the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, which means you have to have an alternative parallel currency in place or currencies in place. Uh, the re to reject the digital identity because this is how they're going to track every move to reject the internet of bodies because this is a way of monitoring and surveilling on your organs and organ systems, including your brain with brain cloud interfacing. And we do this not because we're Luddites. This is the, also going to call us Luddites, neo-Luddites. Um, they're going to call us nutcases who are technophobes and all that. But we don't reject the technology per se. We reject the technology for because of who's wielding it and to what end, right? I mean, this is the key. Yeah, you could. I mean, so like just as one example, a Fitbit, right? Which is a, which is basically a biofeedback wearable, and it could look at anything from your heart rate um, to other other metrics, blood pressure, things like that. How many steps you walk a day? You know, they could they could design that thing to not to not track the data and send it to to some aggregate web, you know uh, database for other uh, analytics or group group analytics in terms of trends across you know various fitness goals uh, across different populations and age groups and genders like this is this is what they're doing with it so you know again the technology itself could be useful to you and they could even yeah. uh, offer it in a way that doesn't have all the things that are the the reason why we're not we don't want to use them but you know until that right. happens uh, you know, the, the costs uh, outweigh the benefits. Absolutely, and I, that's exactly what I what I've said and uh, what I said in the book. At this point, uh, we cannot accept these technologies because of the way they're being they'll be used, in particular the way they'll be wielded to you know surveil and control us in almost every respect, if not every respect, in, in some ways unimaginable. Uh, unimaginable ways at this point. Well, let's, um, I think uh, we've come full circle uh, talking about education and technology and, uh, you know, the system that's being implemented uh, and the means by which it's being done and uh, the ways to resist it. So uh, unless, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I think, I think we, I think we covered the, uh, the waterfront. I think that was, that was a good roundabout. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, it's great to have you, John. And uh, for those uh, who, who are not familiar with your work, I would point them to your book, uh, School World Order, School World Order, uh, which is available everywhere. And do you want to give us uh, some information on how do they, how can uh, readers and listeners, I'm sorry, how can listeners reach you? How can they find your work? Uh, best way to find me is just go to schoolworldorder.info, and then uh, on that website, it's got links to all my social media. Um, you know, I, I don't spend a whole lot of time on Twitter, so if you if you message me on Twitter, uh, you know, it might take me a little while to get back to you. Email is the quickest way. I respond to all my emails. Sometimes it might take me a day or two, but I try to get 24-hour uh, responses. And, uh, but otherwise, yeah, schoolworldorder.info. Uh, is, is where you can find me in my book. Excellent. And so you also put up your articles from the limited, Unlimited Hangout and so forth up there, I would suppose. Okay, yeah, great. yeah. So I, links to all my articles. Um, you know, I do some video reports every now and then. I actually just recently uh, posted a, a video on a new social emotional learning robot called Moxie, which uses GPT AI uh, to not just uh, data mine your your kids' language algorithms, but also face scan them, and, and, and then it aggregates all that data and evolves this social XGPT. So that might be something neat you'd like to check out. I've got that on my 
Bit Shoot, my my YouTube again, both of which are linked on the website. Uh, and there's even a link to bibliography, all the sources in that book, which there's a hundred pages worth of them. It's over a thousand, um, well over a thousand. Uh, and so yeah, all, all sorts of good resources on that website. Excellent. And we'll put that in the show notes. So uh, you know, we got to have you back on. There's so much more we could talk about, but uh, we only have so much time and uh, patience from, from our listeners. So thanks so much for, for coming, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Michael. You're listening to Wrecked with Michael Rechtenwald. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts, and get more content like this on Mises.org.